church. Anyway, hey, if you have your Bibles, <laughs> thank you for uh, inter- uh, just entertaining me there for a moment. Hey, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 is where we're going to be tonight. I know some of you, if you've been with us over the past several weeks, you are like, hey, I thought we were in First or Second Samuel. Uh, and you would be correct, but tonight we're going to kind of take a little bit of a one-off. We're going to take a one-off. We're going to take a break from uh, Second Samuel, and we're going to jump into uh, a passage in Ephesians chapter 6. You know, if you were here this past week, if you were here this past Sunday, uh, Pastor Ethan said something on Sunday morning that I think is super applicable and super important for us to remember. And it was this, is that much of the Christian life, right, a large percentage of the Christian life is simply about remembering. Right, a large percentage of what it means to be a Christian and how we live our Christian life is remembering. It's remembering who God is. It's remembering who we are, remembering what he has called us to do, remembering what he has done for us, and so on. You know, it's funny. Uh, most of the issues that we have as Christians can be boiled down to simply forgetting something. Right? Much of when it comes to our sin is we either forget how holy God is, or we forget how serious our sin is, or we forget all of these different things, and we have a, a knack for doing that. You know, it's funny, really, too, when we think about you know, me as a—when it comes to preaching, you know, the job of the preacher is not necessarily to get up on stage and impress you by telling you something that you didn't already know. Right? Really, the job of the pastor, the job of the preacher is to get on stage and to, for some, it may be things that you did not know, but for most, it should be, hey, this is simply reminding you of things that you should know. And tonight, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to really, we're not, I'm not going to say anything earth shattering. I'm not going to come up here and, and, you know, like we were in the book of Romans, we're going to have this huge theological breakdown of what certain things mean. Really what tonight is going to be, it's going to be a time and an opportunity for us to be reminded. See, memory is huge for a Christian because it, in remembering, it's in remembering that we find our strength to push forward. One of the, most, one of the areas where our memory is needed the most as Christians is in remembering our purpose. You know, it's funny. I think purpose is something that a lot of people crave and desire, but not a lot of people actually have purpose in their life. Right? Not a lot of people really know what they're doing with their life. And you probably, maybe this is where you're at. Maybe you feel this. You're like, man, I don't really know what my purpose is, what I'm doing with my life. I don't know where I'm wanting to go. I don't know what the future holds for me. Those of you who are seniors and you feel like, man, I, don't, I haven't found a purpose. I don't, and, and, and it makes you nervous. Some of you, let's get, let's like, let's get even sm- you know, smaller scale. You, you, what, you don't, what's the purpose in you being here? You know, purpose is something that everyone's looking for, but so few people actually have. And as Christians, our focus, our purpose is the focus of the mission that God has given us. Our mission, which is of of utmost importance. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be starting in verse 10. And in the very first word there is the word finally. Paul is coming to the end, we're coming to the end of Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus, and in this letter, Paul has explained a lot. He's explained a lot about the Christian's position in Christ. He's talked about how we are saved by grace, right? Saved by grace through faith, not, a, not of our own works, lest any man should boast, right? How we, and then talked about how we should properly respond to this position we have in Jesus by the way that we live. Right? The first part, and this is what most of the epistles do in the New Testament, if you pay attention to them. In the beginning, there's a short, you know, there's a section of, hey, this is who you are in Jesus. This is what Jesus has done for you. This is, you know, a, the gospel, whether it's super short or if it's like in the book of Romans, it's the first, you know, 11 or 10 chapters or 12 chapters. Right, so I, either way, you have this, you know, hey, this is who you are in Jesus, but now here's how you respond. Here's how this impacts the way that you live. And right before this, Paul speaks about the importance of unity within the body of Christ. In chapter 5, Paul gives more instructions on how to glorify God with various relationships that you and I may find ourselves in, right? Whether it's husbands and wives, slaves and masters, even parents and children. Now, all of these things that Paul has written about are vital to fulfilling the mission that Christ has given us. I say, what is the mission that God has given us? We're talking about the Great Commission, right? Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 28. 
says, go therefore unto all the world, uh, unto all the nations, baptizing, uh, making disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I have commanded you. And, know, and lo, I am with you even to the ends of the age. That's the mission of the church. The purpose of the Christian, if you're in this room and you call yourself a Christian, the purpose of your life is, the, is simply this, to make disciples. That's it. It's not to make money. It's not to make yourself known. It's not to, uh, uh, you know, attain status. It is to make disciples. There is no other mission. When I became student pastor here at Central, this April will be five years ago. When I became student pastor here at Central, the first thing that you begin to think about is, man, what, like, what's a mission? What's the mission of our student ministry? What's, like, our mission statement? Or what's a mission of our student ministry, right? And after a while, I began to realize that the mission of the student ministry is the same as the mission of the church, right? It's not that you have a mission and I have a mission. We all have one mission, and that is to make disciples. There are no side quests in the Christian faith. This is not a mission for some. It's not a mission just for the pastors. It's for you in your seat right now. See, oftentimes we hear people talk about unity. But here we're not talking about unity just for the sake of unity. We're talking about unity with a purpose. You know, if you know me, there's a few things that I love and there's a few things that I hate. One thing that I loathe with a passion is traffic. I can't stand traffic. I despise traffic. Right? And in that moment where you're sitting in traffic and you're not moving, you and all of the people around you are very unified, right? You're very unified. All of you suffer with the same struggle of sitting in traffic. All of you are going around the same speed. All of you are in the same location. You're all headed in the same direction. All of you are united. But what's so frustrating is that you're united for no purpose because you're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. All that unity doesn't bring a whole lot of peace. I want you to understand something, that as Christians in the church, unity without direction is just sitting in traffic. All the relationships that you form in here on Tuesday nights and on Sunday mornings and throughout the week, if you both are, if you and your friends are not sold out for the mission of making disciples, you're just sitting in traffic. See, when you're saved, you've joined in this mission that is greater than you could possibly imagine. Our church does not simply exist for the sake of existing. We do not exist for the sake of entertainment or even for philanthropy and doing good works in the community. We exist to glorify God by making disciples. And when we gather, right, Tuesday nights when we gather to do this, we are doing this to be equipped and encouraged for the purpose of the mission. That's it. That's the purpose. So with that in mind, I want us to read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. So if you have your Bibles, Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, I encourage you to stand with me real quick. Just a few verses as we read together tonight. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Paul says to the church in Ephesus, he says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. If you would just pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for tonight. Father, we pray that you would accomplish your will through your word in your people tonight. God, we thank you and we praise you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. All right, so Paul, giving his final teaching, this, this final portion of the book of Ephesus, Paul wants to give some final teachings to the Ephesians. He's going to conclude his letter. That word, finally. Right? He's for, for, you know, for five chapters, five and a half chapters, he has been laboring in his teaching and his writing to them, and he gets to the end and he says, finally. Finally, this is the last thing. Finally, here we are. 
that's what he's saying, in light of all of that I've already told you, in light of all this truth, here's what I want you to remember. He's going to talk about this mission, and there's a, there's a few things, there's three things that I want to see about our mission as Christians. And the first thing is this, is that the mission is difficult. The mission is difficult. First thing, he says, finally, what? Be strong. Paul continues, he says, be strong. You don't have to be a Christian for very long to, to see that the Christian life is not the easiest life. It's not easy to be a Christian. If anyone says that it is easy to be a Christian, they're either not living a Christian life or they're just lying. Matthew seven fourteen: for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. 2 Timothy 3.12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But here's the thing. Why is it so difficult to be a Christian? Why is it so difficult to live in this life, to say yes to righteousness, to say no to wickedness? Why is it so hard for us to walk as Christ has called us to walk? Why is it so difficult to point others to Christ while at the same time pursuing him ourselves? I believe there's a few reasons for this, but the number one reason, the number one reason why this is so difficult, why it's so hard to live a Christian life is this. We are sinners. Like I said, it's not going to be anything news, news flashing tonight, right? But this is important to remind yourself. The reason it is so hard, the reason we struggle is because we're sinners. See, we're all born with this inherent, this inherent problem. This, this, all of us are born naturally this way. None of us is exempt from this problem. That we are born with a sinful flesh with sinful desires. We are naturally selfish and naturally self-seeking. I have a child. She is like one and a half. She's perfect, by the way. But I'll tell you this. There is, I have learned, they just come out naturally selfish. A child is never looking to be generous, right? They're naturally selfish. Romans 3.10 says this, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. This is the condition of every human being apart from Jesus. All of us are like this. Later in the same chapter, Paul will say to the Romans that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Right, we're naturally self-seeking, naturally self-glorifying. This includes me on this platform right now. If you're a parent, right, if you, uh, you are going to be a parent, like I said, you will learn this sooner enough. However, as Christians... What, is the, what, is, what does it mean for us to be a Christ follower? As Christians, we are supposed to be selfless, right? And God-glorifying, not selfish and self-glorifying. We are called to be selfless and God-glorifying. We are told the first will be last and the last will be first. We are commanded to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. The problem is that this flies in the face of every natural tendency that you and I have. This is perfectly explained in, in Galatians 5.17. I love this passage. Galatians 5.17 says this, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. You see, the conflict is what makes this so difficult. What he's saying is this, is that naturally the sinful flesh desires sin all the time. That's what it wants. But as a Christian, when you are saved, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit God has placed inside of you, desires righteousness. And where, when you were not a Christian, where there was no conflict, when you get saved, now there is conflict. Because now you have the Spirit of God within you. You still have your sinful flesh. You are justified in the eyes of God. But you have a battle now raging within you. And I want you to understand something. What you feed will grow. If you feed the flesh, the flesh will grow. If you feed the spirit, the spirit will grow. This is why, as Christians, like reading our Bible is something that we love to do, and it's so encouraging, but at the same time, it's something that we hate to make time for doing it. Why? Because you have two 
desires waging war within you. Paul makes this clear in Romans 7. Right? We have this battle within us all the time. We're in conflict. Therefore, we must be strong. That's why Paul says, be strong. Be strong. You know what he means by being strong? Being strong is dying to your sinful desires. That's what it means to be strong. I want you to know something. It does not take strength to be selfish. It does not take strength to do what you naturally want to do all the time. It does not take strength to give in to temptation and look at that thing you shouldn't look at. It does not take strength to cuss somebody out when they make you mad. It does not take strength to lash out emotionally at people. You know what it takes strength to do? To say no to that addiction. To say no to that desire to cuss somebody out. To say no to lashing out emotionally. Why? Because that's what we're called to do. That's what it means to be strong. True strength is found in laying down your life for the cause of the greater mission. Dying to self. Right? Galatians 2.20, Paul says, what? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I, I now live, I live for the glory of God. Right? When I have been crucified, my old life, my old self was crucified with Jesus. Jesus put it best in Matthew 16.24-25. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. See, to live for Christ, you must be willing to die to yourself. It means all of my natural things that I may want, I offer them up to God. Now, not all the things that I may want are bad. But you know what? I ultimately lay those down at the feet of Jesus, and I allow him to give back to me whatever he sees fit. See, that sounds all well and good, but we have another issue. If my natural tendency is to not do this, then how can I find the strength to do so? Do I just, do I just grip my teeth together and just try my hardest? How do, how do I find the strength to do this? Well, he goes on. What does he say? Be strong. How? In the Lord and in the strength of his might. See, Paul's not simply encouraging the Ephesians to be strong and then not telling them how. He's telling them be strong in the Lord. He's reminding them of where their strength comes from. True strength, tr true spiritual, true Christian strength is not found in self-discipline. It's found in relying on Jesus. See, the strength to deny yourself is found only in Christ. The strength to endure hardship and trust in the sovereignty of God comes only through Christ. The strength to share the gospel with your, with your friends. The strength to share the gospel with your family members who are lost. The strength to share the gospel with those. The, the strength to make disciples comes by depending on Jesus and not on yourself. The strength for our church to make disciples of all people is found only in Christ, not in a pastor, not in programs, but in Jesus. See, as a church, we can have all the greatest programs. We can have the greatest student ministry, which I think we do. You can have the greatest kids ministry, which, hey, I think we do. You can have the greatest senior pastor. You can have the greatest music. You can have the greatest facilities. You can have all the greatest things. You can have the greatest outreach events, the best music. But if as a church we are finding our strength in those things, then all we're doing is stacking up firewood to be burned at the end of time. We're wasting our time. As Christians, it's very easy for many to find strength of their church based on the skills of their pastor. This is all, this is all the time. There are a lot of big name churches and when you say the name of the church, the first thing that comes to mind is the pastor and the, you think to yourself, if that pastor were to leave, would that church survive? 
A lot of churches do this, not just the lead pastor, but the student pastor. My goal is for this student ministry, you all, to depend on Jesus so much that if anything, God forbid, were to ever happen to me, then this ministry would keep on cruising because it's not built on me, it's built on Jesus. See, we... We depend on a pastor with their ability to preach or their charisma or their vision or their leadership skills. Well, all of those things are very helpful and very good. If that man or if that man does not dep- is not finding his strength alone in Jesus, it does not matter. You remember the story of Samson? Right? Book of Judges. Long hair, really strong. If I was to ask you to close your eyes, you don't need to do this, but if I was to ask you to close your eyes and and picture in your mind what Samson looked like, if we would all, first first of all, incredibly flowing long hair, right? We just imagine long hair. Maybe you think of big, bulging muscles because of his strength and all of these different things. Here's the question I have for you. Why do we picture Samson with these big, bulging muscles? Right? Why do we picture Samson this way? Because here's the thing that I want to I remind you. If Samson's strength came from his big, bulging muscles, why would Delilah constantly ask him where his strength comes from? The thing that makes Samson so, in, so such, such an anomaly to people is that he was strong and there was no external reason for it. But what are we so quick to do? The Bible says he's strong, so he had to have big muscles. Even though the Bible tells us his strength comes from God, we attribute it to muscles. You see how quickly we do this, how subliminally we do this, and we don't even think about it. See, the fact of the matter is, is that we're so ready to find our strength in so many things other than God. If we want to see the gospel shine forth from our church, and if we want to see God use us as individuals to make disciples of our friends and of our family members and of our people, the people at school, it's going to start not by us focusing on, on the things that we lack, but focusing on the fact that we depend on Jesus to do the work. It's not going to start with programs or music choices. It's going to start when each person in this room right now finds themselves daily at the feet of Jesus, seeking to be strengthened by him. That's what's going to change our city, our churches, our families, our schools for God's glory. Understand this, that revival starts in the seats, not from the stage. I spoke with a student a while ago, and they asked me if I get nervous to preach on Sunday mornings. I get a lot of people, and you know, and, and there was a time where I used to. I don't really get nervous uh, to do it anymore. And here's the reason, right? My job when I'm preaching is I'm like a waiter at a restaurant. The chef makes the food. My goal is to get the food to the table without messing it up, right? That's the job. Just don't trip, don't breathe in it, right? Don't change it, get it to the table. You never see a waiter or waitress grab the food and start sprinkling salt on it as they take it to the table. Why? Because that's not their job. Understand this, my job is to take what God has prepared, what God has made, given, and said to you in his word, and to present it to you. And as soon as I get away from that, then I have reason to be nervous because I've taken myself away from the certainty of Scripture and I've stepped onto the ledge of uncertainty by depending on my skills. As soon as I start to do that, then I have reason to be nervous. John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We see that the mission is difficult. It's hard. It's hard to make disciples. Don't let anybody tell you, hey, we'll make disciples. Why aren't you doing it? It's so easy. It's not easy. The mission is difficult, but so we should find our strength in God. But not only is the mission difficult, but the second thing we see is this, is that the mission is spiritual. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand up against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood 
but against the powers, rulers, and against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. How do we strengthen ourselves in the Lord? We, we, we talk about, okay, hey, strengthen yourself in Jesus. Okay, what does that mean? What does it mean? Right? It isn't by focusing on the physical. We've talked about that. Right? We strengthen ourselves in the Lord by understanding that we are engaged in a spiritual battle. And the key to victory is not found in physical things. A while back, a few years ago, Kayla and I, we, we saw the movie Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Right? You guys know this movie? Heard of it once or twice? At the end of the movie, there's a point at the end of the movie where they're kind of in this battle, right? And they're battling against these creatures. It's like a typical Marvel ending, right? They're battling against, like, this faceless army. and you know. But there's this one point where they're fighting these creatures, and, and they have to use weapons that have been forged from these dragon scales, right? It's the only way that you can defeat these, these creatures, right? And there's a point where one guy tries to fight, right? He tries to fight this creature with his own weapon, and he gets worked. And basically what happens is that there's uh, one of the women kind of looks at him and says, hey, put that away. Your weapons are no good against them. I want you to see this is similar to our, the spiritual battle that we're engaged in every single day, right? If you're, if you're going to fight a spiritual battle, you need spiritual armor. And this is where the armor of God is laid out. We see this in the next few verses, the belt of truth, the pre- breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and prayer. Notice that a spiritual mission requires spiritual armor. And you can do a whole sermon series just on the armor of God. So we're not going to get into all the details here. However, I want you to see what Paul says here in verse 11. He says this. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Do you see that? The whole armor of God. You see, when we find our strength in God, he does not send us out half-equipped. Within the entire armor of God is everything we need for the mission that God has given us. We depend on the truth of his word. We're protected because of the breastplate of Jesus' righteousness. Not not trying to earn God's favor through my righteousness, but knowing that Jesus' righteousness is enough. That I'm constantly strapped to my feet or the readiness to share the gospel at any moment. That what holds me together, what holds me fast is the shield of faith. Whenever I'm tempted to doubt or tempted to worry, I I hold my faith close, knowing that that's what keeps me together. The helmet of salvation, that apart from salvation, none of it even matters. Being saved by faith, by grace through faith. The sword of the Spirit. It all comes together. It's all activated through prayer. Understand this. Maybe the reason that you're spiritually getting your butt kicked is because you don't pray. Perhaps. Guilty. Guilty. See, there's no shortcoming on God's part. We desperately need to know that there is not a part of the armor that we can afford to be without. In addition, it's interesting that this is not the only time we see the armor of God mentioned in Scripture. If you go to Isaiah 59, Isaiah writes, uh, writes this about the Lord. Isaiah 59, he says this, He puts on righteousness as a breastplate. He's talking about God. God puts on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And I think this is huge for us to understand, right? That you're not equipped with your version of God's armor. That when, as a Christian, you're equipped with God's armor. God himself takes his armor and places it upon you. Man, that's amazing. Why is this amazing? It's because of this. It's because the breastplate of righteousness is not the breastplate of your righteousness. It's the breastplate of God's righteousness. It's his goodness. The salvation that covers you is not a salvation of your own doing. It's God's salvation that is placed on you. 
Drawing back to Ephesians 1, 3, what does it say? Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. See, as a child of God, you have an unbeatable armor. And why is this armor so important? Continue on in the passage we're reading. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Understand this, we have a real enemy as Christians. We have a real enemy. The Bible talks of him as the accuser, the adversary, appearing as an angel of light. He is a liar. He is a murderer. He is the deceiver. He is the lawless one. He seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. The word schemes of the devil here, the word schemes here is, has a connotation of cunning and trickery. Literally what the term means is to lie in wait. 1 Peter 5, 8 says this, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. I know that, like, we don't focus a lot on this for some reason. But know this, that spiritual warfare is real. The devil is real. Demons are real. And we like to dismiss everything as, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. But understand this, is that... You cannot be ignorant of how Satan works. It's been said that the greatest trick the devil has ever pulled is convincing the world that he does not exist. Satan is just as real as God is. The difference is that he's not as powerful as God is. But he is just as real. Why do we emphasize this? Why do I take time to focus on this? Is because in our efforts to accomplish the mission, we're going to be tempted to wage war against the wrong things. Let me give you an example. Several years ago, if you know me, you know that I'm a Florida Gator fan. And several years ago, there was a moment that I will never forget. Florida Gators tried to run an off-tackle run to the right side. And it actually was a good run, somehow. You know, like a 15-yard carry. But if you watch the replay, there are two Florida Gator offensive linemen doing the unthinkable. They are blocking one another. They are blocking one another. Let's think about this for a second. It would be like LeBron James going up for a layup and Anthony Davis blocking it. They're blocking each other. This is unheard of. What are you doing? What are they doing? And what gets even more frustrating is when you hear their, them give the explanation for how it happened. It made me just want to puke. It's infuriating. Listen to what he says. They asked them, hey, how does that happen? Which is a legit question. And they said this, sometimes... You really don't see. You lock on to somebody, and you don't really notice who you're blocking. Just two guys trying to play hard and do their job, and they happen to get messed up. Hopefully that won't happen again. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. To be fair, this happened to Florida State a couple years ago as well. Apparently it's an epidemic in the state of Florida. But here's, did you hear what he just said? Is that he couldn't see what was going on, so he just grabbed somebody and started pushing them. Apparently, the other guy thought the same thing. And this sounds ridiculous, because it is. But this is the way so many Christians live their lives. Is that they don't know who their enemy is. They don't know what's coming against them. So what happens is they just grab something and push. They're just spiritually firing off in all directions. Understand this. Your enemy as a Christian is not the culture. Your enemy is not your unsaved friends. Your enemy is not your unsaved parents. Your enemy is not who's in the White House. Your enemy is not those in government. Your enemy is the devil. It is Satan. There are a lot of Christians genuinely trying to accomplish the mission, but they have no idea who their enemy is, so they just start firing off. Verse 13, what does it say? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. 
but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil who are in the heavenly places. Who know this. Know who the real enemy is. Your enemy is not a Democrat or a Republican. Your enemy is not the people living in blatant, unrepentant sin around you. Your enemy is Satan, and he is perfectly content to sit back and let you and watch you fight all the wrong battles. And some of us have gotten really good at fighting battles that don't matter. See, we're called to share the gospel and make disciples of those that are lost, and here we are fighting with them in the comment sections on social media. How can you possibly think to reach someone with the gospel when you're just a butthead to them? Like, let's think about this. They are not your enemy. They are lost and headed to hell apart from Jesus. And that should break your heart, not anger you. Notice a subtle thing here in verse 13. It says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers. And it keeps on going. But do you notice that Paul is not calling the believer into a spiritual warfare? He's not saying, hey, get involved in this battle. He, he's, he isn't saying, join the fight against the devil. He is simply announcing this, that the fight is happening. You are in a battle whether you acknowledge it or not. And some of you may be sitting here thinking, what battle? I don't see a battle. I don't see any spiritual battle. I'll tell you this, that a lot of Christians don't know that the battle is going on because they don't go where the battle is taking place. Rather than engage in a spiritual battle, we seem to shelter us, ourselves from it. But understand this, is that the battle is coming at you whether you go to public school or home school. It doesn't matter where you go to school. It doesn't matter where you work. A spiritual battle is a spiritual one. So rather than seek to shelter your friends or family, you know what you do? You disciple them. And again, it's not easy. The mission's difficult. But, but that brings us to our last thing, though. It's difficult. It's not easy. It's spiritual. And the last thing is this, that the mission is worth it. It is worth it. Continuing on in Ephesians 6, says this, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me, and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now, you may not know this, but Paul is writing this letter from a prison cell in Rome. He's writing this from a prison cell. Paul had been thrown in prison for fulfilling the mission. He's been thrown in prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And do you notice what he asks them to pray about? He says this, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Notice this. He was in prison for preaching the gospel and what he asks them to pray for is that he would have boldness to continue to do it. That's a strength that comes not from the, the things of this world. That's a strength that comes from no matter what happens to me, Jesus has got me. And the worst thing this world can do is to kill me and send me to him. In Paul's mind, he probably thought this, man, if they're going to arrest me for preaching the gospel, I might as well be guilty of it. Let me ask you something. Where does this kind of boldness come from? Where does this type of boldness come from? Why would Paul be so eager to suffer for the mission? Because he knew that the mission was worth it. He understood that the gospel's worth was more valuable than he could possibly fathom. That he understood that the gospel's, that he understood the gospel's worth because he saw what it did to his life. And I want you to understand something. Perhaps the reason you don't see this mission as worth it is because you haven't seen it do anything to your life. 
Perhaps Jesus hasn't, perhaps you don't have a relationship with Jesus, and because of that, you don't care if others do or not. 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul says this, this, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full, of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Meaning this, Paul says that Jesus came into the world to, sin, to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. I was the worst. If you know Paul's testimony, that he was a persecutor of Christians, that he would arrest Christians and have them put to death because of their faith in Jesus, and that he was on the road to Damascus where Jesus appeared to him and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And over time what happens is that Paul's life radically changed, and the one who was putting Christians to death for their faith ultimately would give his life for that same faith. Now, a lot of people will die for something that is not true. No one dies for something that they know is not true. He was convinced, and he knew it was worth it. All the motivation needed for the mission can be found by looking at what Jesus did on the cross. Knowing that he took the punishment that you deserve, that because he suffered, you can live in eternity with him. And if you have that assurance, you can live your life sold out for the purpose of making disciples, no matter what your career is. Whether you work at a church, you work at a bank, you work at what other sales company, whatever it may be, right? You can live your life with confidence, knowing that no matter what happens in this life your eternity is secure and because of that you live your life on mission for others knowing it's worth it the sad thing is is that we live our lives for so many things that honestly are just not worth it we come in here we sing songs I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest. Can I be honest with you? I struggle because there's times, you know, where I look out and I see people talking. I see people not caring what I'm saying. And I try not to assume, right? Because sometimes, hey, you just got to tell somebody something. You know, I get it, whatever. But then it's clear when people have, could care less what I'm saying. I think it's funny, too, like, we just kind of assume that I'm not looking at you while it's happening. And what breaks my heart, honestly, is that this is life-changing. And maybe not for you. Maybe you don't care. But the person next to you, it could be life-changing for them. And you know what? If all you have to do is simply be quiet so that their life can be changed because of the Word of God, you know what? It's worth it. It's worth it. And again, I want you guys to know that to live your life for the purpose of making Jesus famous, you will never be disappointed. You may not make a ton of money. You may not have all the friends in the world. You may not be the most popular person, but I will tell you this. You will never, no minute spent for Jesus is ever regretted. 